Calling Church family, so excited to worship with you guys today. So if I can encourage you wherever you may be at, come on, let's press and let's worship our God today. Come on. I search, I search the world, it couldn't fill me, man's empty praise, treasures and faith are never enough, then you came along.
Love. 
declares today. May his favor be upon you in a thousand generations. And your family, and your children, and your children, and the children. May his favor be upon you in a thousand generations. And your family, and their children, and their children. Come on, may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and their children and their children and their children. May his presence go before. Amazing. Can we give the awesome band and the team a clapping emoji? Uh, so great to be with you this beautiful, amazing Sunday morning. It's always an honor and a joy. Hey, uh, something so powerful and amazing and special happened this week. Come on, y'all. The Dodgers won the World Series. Yes, we're talking about Dodgers in church, and that's okay. This is our city, boo-boo. Come on, somebody. We've been praying for this, and we've been waiting for this for 32 years. God loves L.A. We are the champions of the world. the 
champions of the world. Go Dodgers. We've been waiting for this moment for so, so long. And it feels great. Honestly, I uh, kept pinching myself the next day because it was just uh, almost unbelievable. It's been a long, long time coming. Hey, well, welcome to the Calling Church. We're so grateful that you're here with us this morning. You're normally in church service. This is the time where we take an opportunity to meet someone we never met before, just to love on each other. If you're watching with your children right now, if you're with your wife or your husband or your cousins, or maybe you're alone right now, we want you to take this opportunity to love on each other. Say, I love you, honey. Say, I love you, babe. All right. I love you, kids. If you're alone right now, I'm giving you a big virtual hug. We love you. Uh, So good to be with you this morning. Welcome to the Calling Church at Home. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Church at Home. My name is Ronnie, and we're so thankful that you're tuning in again this Sunday. Hey, and we know it's been tough not being able to see everyone every week, but we want to let you know that next Sunday, November the 8th, it's our outdoor in-person service. We want to invite you to come on down next week. We'd love to see you. We'd love to worship with you. We'd love to fellowship with you. And because of the change in seasons, we're moving our service time from 4.30 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. So please follow the link on your screen. Uh, Sign up and we can't wait to see you next Sunday. And now it's time for our offering. And as you prepare your heart this morning for our offering, I'd love to be able to share this verse with you. It's found in the book of Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. And the Bible says, Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. And so I wish I can say that I've always gotten this area right in my life, but at the start of COVID, me being the only income provider for our home, it was so easy for me to get caught up in my worries and to get caught up in my fears and not to focus on the Lord. But through this verse and the encouragement of some some great people around me, I placed my trust and my hope back on Jesus. I seek after Him in everything that I did, and I watched as God provided for all of my needs more than I could ever even hope to imagine. So we want to encourage you this morning not to focus on your worries, not to amplify your fears, but to amplify Jesus and watch as he provides for all of your needs. Let's pray this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you this morning, God. We're just so grateful for everything that you do, God. Lord, today we want to amplify you, Father. We want to focus on you. We ask, God, that you would quiet the worry and that you would quiet the fear, Father. Help us to live a life that is completely and 100% sold out for you, God. We thank you, Lord, for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, let's get excited as we turn over the rest of our service to Pastor Michael, and he concludes with our Peacemaker series. Hey, church, good morning. So great to be with you. Happy, beautiful Sunday morning. Um, uh, so great to be with you. I Wel- uh, just want to welcome my chat crew right now. Thank you so much for your faithfulness, for your engagement, and all of you guys who are watching right now. Uh, if it's your first time with us, I want. Uh, my name is Pastor Michael Alfaro. I'm the lead pastor of this church. I lead it with my wife, who's an amazing lead pastor as well. And by the way, if you are watching for the first time or you've been watching for a few weeks, hey, send us an email uh, to connect at thecallingla.com. We want to hear from you. We want to know how you found us or who invited you. And uh, we just want to say a hello to you and welcome. And uh, we're so grateful for your participation um, in our service. We know that our church has been growing in this season as it's been online. So welcome and good morning. Uh, I, I know I'm, I'm, I just was speaking about it earlier, but man, I am so thrilled that the Dodgers have won the World Series. Isn't it amazing? I grew up with my grandparents and my parents talking about, you know, the good old days of 1981 and, and Tommy Lasorda and, and all of the greats, Fernando Valenzuela and 1988 of Kirk Gibson. And it was always talk about the past, but hey, now in 2020, we have our own championship championship, uh, a, a championship trophy. It's been a long time coming Lakers and Dodgers. It's awesome. What an incredible, and honestly, what an incredible joy to have uh, away from all of the things that have been happening, happening in the world, right? So awesome. Hey, we're going to be c- continuing our series called Peacemakers. Uh, this has been a three-week series, and the goal of our series of Peacemakers has been to talk about uh, a characteristic of Christ, is to talk about Uh, As Christians, we have the responsibility 
to be peacemakers, especially in the season and in the climate that we're living in today. We are right in the middle of an election. And just in a few days, people have voted already. People are going to go to uh, the polls and we're, we're going to vote. If you haven't voted, please vote. It's your civic responsibility. All right. And we're going to find out who's going to be the leader of the free world. All right. So go vote. But we are precisely in this series because we want to talk about being peace, peacemakers, excuse me, and representing the kingdom righteously. I want to let you know that as Americans, your, your, uh, the America is not your only government. Your government is also the kingdom of God in which we are ambassadors and given the ministry of reconciliation. Uh, all right, so let's go ahead and go into our scripture this morning. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5, 9 and Romans 14, 19. It says this, blessed or some translations say happy, blessed, uh, blessed in brackets, amplified, amplified, obviously, what does it do? It amplifies the scripture. Blessed or spiritually calm with life joy in God's favor. Watch this. Are the makers and maintainers, are the makers and the maintainers of peace, for they will express his character. Someone write his character on the chat right now, or just write character. His character and be called the sons of God. Romans 14, 19 in the MEV version, it says this, therefore let us pursue the things which produce peace and the things that build up one another. The title of my message this morning is called The Character of Christ. The Character of Christ. And we're ending our three week series today on peacemakers. Let's go ahead and pray for the sermon. Father, we thank you so much for this time and opportunity we have to gather online. God, we're thankful for the faithfulness of your people who are gathering online with us this morning and all over the world and so many different churches. God, on Sundays, we call it the Lord's Day because we celebrate, yes, it was the day that you were raised from the dead, but we also celebrate uh, the first day of the week being being that it is the Lord's Day. God, we devote this time to you. God, it's our joy to spend time with you and hear the word. Father, I pray for you to inspire us Move us. The Bible says, Lord, that you are the potter and we are the clay. Holy Spirit, shape us, groove us and move us. God, into the people that you called us to be. And let us not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word as well. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen and amen. There's a famous story of two famous, really famous Christians in the medieval times around the years of 1500s and 1600s. Uh, These were two Christian, amazing, prominent leaders. But uh, as you may have known, there's conflict in the world. And uh, these two Christian leaders who were leading two different great, amazing movements were in conflict and they just couldn't seem to resolve this conflict. And one of these amazing Christian leaders was praying, Lord, I don't want there to be any more conflict. I want there to be resolve and resolution uh, with my brother in Christ. And as he was praying to his amazement, he looked out his window and he lived uh, by these beautiful uh, uh, Swiss Alps, the mountains. And he saw these beautiful mount, two mountain goats. And by the way, mountain goats, have you watched the Discovery Channel lately? They are some crazy animals. Crazy in the sense that I don't know how they balance on these slopes. It's ridiculous. It's crazy. You think that they can't do it, right? They're not shaped for it, but they do. So as he was, as he was praying, he looked out the mountain slopes and he felt like the Lord spoke to him because he saw these two mountain goats that were opposite of each other and they were directly coming at each other trying to cross each other's paths. Well, the the thing is that they were walking on very thin, uh, narrow pieces of the mountain. And the the Christian leader, this amazing prominent man, he looked closer and deeper and believed God was speaking to him through this uh, confrontation with these mountain goats. He thought, man, these mountain goats are surely, they're going to charge each other and they're going to butt heads and they're going to ram each other and the only one is going to survive while the other one falls off the cliff and is dashed to pieces, so to speak. But as he looked deeper and as he watched closely as these mountain goats started to approach each other on, these very narrow, on this very narrow uh, part of the mountain, he noticed something amazing. As they got closer... And they had no room to turn back. They had no room to go side by side and go around each other. Uh, What what had happened is one mountain goat, instead of 
uh, creating conflict, lowered himself so that the other mountain goat can go above and, or, and over the other one who was beneath him. So that in turn, each were able to go their directions without any conflict or dismay. And as this Christian leader looked at, at that moment, he realized God had answered his prayer. See, the reality, church, is sometimes um, we have to submit ourselves. And there's scriptures in the Bible that in order to make peace and be a peacemaker, sometimes we bring ourselves to a position of humility and lower ourselves and, and with respect and strength. So that way there is no conflict. You say, pastor, that just sounds like weakness. But watch this. Let me, I have a lot to say about this in the scripture. Uh, obviously, what had happened was these leaders resolved the conflict as they were working in humility together, all right? Now, let me tell you about the world right now. Uh, uh, in the world, there is so much conflict, so much conflict. Watch this. There are over, and, uh, the, uh, right now, there are over 40 conflicts in the entire world right now. Countries at war with each other are war, at war with themselves, civil war. You might say, Pastor, man, I didn't know that. Uh, and we're praying for our, our, our Armenians, brothers and sisters who come to our church and our community because they're at war right now with Azerbaijan right now. Okay, and we're praying for them. But you say, Pastor, I didn't know where at, the world is at war. I didn't know that. Maybe I heard about a few wars, but no, the, the, we, the media doesn't cover everything. Newsflash, all right? There are over 40 conflicts of war right now. All right. Right now, I want you to know that in every 13 seconds, there is a divorce in the United States of America. Every year in America, there's 2.4 million divorces. There's conflict right now in marriages and families. Last year, there was 105,000 cases, 105,000 cases of aggravated assault just in the state of California alone. And according to the CDC in 2018, suicide was the 10th leading cause of death, especially people who are in the ages between 10 and 34 years old. And God knows how many suicides have been happening this year because of COVID and 2020. Not to mention our country is in conflict right now with each other, with ourselves. We are facing division and dissension and factions and strife because of this election and of things that we're going through. And I want to let you know right now, ladies and gentlemen, church, children of God, men of God, women of God, it's time to wake up and realize that there is a lot of conflict in the world. And what does that have to do with you? Someone once said, God, man, there's a lot of conflict in the world. What are you going to do about it? God turned around and told that person, I, I'm sending you. I chose you to help be the solution. I want to let you know that this message series has been precisely to waken us up, to stir us, that it's not just about red and blue, but it's also about the gray, the in-between, about the Christians stepping in the gap and being bridge builders and bridge takers, or, or bridge connect, or connectors, excuse me, and not ditches where people crash and, and, and are hurt and are harmed. All right, it's not just about the elephant and it's not just about the donkey. It's about the lamb, about what the lamb of God is doing in a season like this. I love what Romans chapter 15, verse 17, B says, it's the, about the kingdom of God. Watch this. A, the kingdom of God is a, a, a kingdom of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. All right. Uh, as I've been spending a lot of time with Jesus in this, in this series, you know, every time I preach, and especially I'm, when I'm preaching a series, one thing I always do is I baptize my messages or the messages of God in prayer. They're coming from Jesus, I promise you. And every time as I'm praying over the sermons, I'm also, especially this series, God, I'm asking God, what, what is, what do, how can I learn? I want to let you know before I even pre preach a message to you, I'm tasting the food first. God is speaking to me. And as I've been uh, uh, preparing this message in this message series, I've been asking God, God, am I a peacemaker? Church, are you a peacemaker or are you a troublemaker? You know, the Bible says that the, the peacemakers shall be called the sons of God, the children of God. It's because they're manifesting peace 
in their life, in their relationships and in other relationships. But if we're called the children of God because we're being peacemakers, well, guess who the father is of discord, of dissension and factions and of hatred and disunity. Guess who the father is of all of that? That is Satan. That is his name, Lucifer. And guess who are the, guess who are the children of Lucifer? The ones who are causing dissension. So I've been on my knees and I've been praying, God, am I a peacemaker? Or am I a troublemaker? I have a, that, that's a question to you right now. And honestly, I've had to repent because I realized that I actually on my way to church this morning, as I was just meditating on the word and meditating on the scripture, I, asked, I looked over and asked my wife, honey, am I a peacemaker or am I a troublemaker? And honestly, her reply was a burst of laughter. She just started laughing. She didn't even give me a reply because she knows, honestly, church, my nature and my human flesh is that I'm a troublemaker. Come on, somebody. I come from Pomona and Baldwin Park at the same time. My nature and my flesh is to just to, was want, to want to talk about people and badmouth people and badmouth presidents and lead out of flesh. Isn't that our human nature? Come on, somebody. I know I'm not alone. And and I know that I'm not talking to just only holy people, or I should say it like this. Uh, 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 we're all a work in progress, right? Uh, including myself. But that's the thing about being a peacemaker. And as I've been spending time with Jesus, and I think about Jesus, man, watch this. He is the prince of peace. Jesus doesn't simply talk about peace. Jesus doesn't just simply hold peace. Jesus isn't just simply about passivism or passivity. Watch this. Jesus is the embodiment of peace. And I can't tell you how much this means to me as I've reflected upon this series and as I've been just being uh, um, sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to the Holy Spirit. All right. But Jesus is the prince of peace. Do you realize when he was on the earth, Jesus ate at the houses of lepers. He had ate at the houses of tax collectors. He was known as the friend of sinners. At one point in Jesus's ministry, there was a woman brought to him who was caught in the very act. I mean, how embarrassing, how humiliating. She was caught in the very act of committing adultery. And the Pharisees brought, them, brought her to him. And, and, we, and, and the story goes, Jesus is riding on the ground. And they say, Jesus, we caught this woman red handed. The law says she needs to be stoned to death. Do you remember his reply? You, have, you who have not sinned, cast the first stone. See what Jesus is doing is he's creating peace and he's reconciling people to God. He is a peacemaker. He is the embodiment of peace himself. And I want to let you know that if you have no peace this morning, get yourself in a room, close the door, start praying and just start worshiping him or just, just say a humble prayer to, him, prayer to him. And I promise you, peace will start to flood your direction. Peace that is incomprehensible, pre peace that passes understanding. That's what God does. And that's what God, that's who God is. So if you need peace in your life, I, I just pray that you would humbly submit yourself to the prince of it. And, I, and if you're like me, where you're just, you, you can't lead out of the nature of your flesh because it's not what a peacemaker naturally does. He wants to fight or fight. All right. But we're called to lead out of the spirit and not out of the flesh. And right now you might be in disagreement with someone who doesn't agree with your politics. Right now you might be in disagreement with someone in your relationships, maybe an ex-husband or ex-wife or so, so and so at work. And, you, and you're saying, Pastor Michael, this series has, was designed to, for me to be a peacemaker. And I'm saying, absolutely yes. And the way that this is possible, watch this, is through the P Prince of peace. It's not supposed to be done through, by you and only through you. You're not the person that is supposed to only manufacture it. God wants to work through you by, you by him being your mentor and your savior and your leader. You know what I, I know what I think? A lot of times people say peace, being a peacemaker is, uh, is weak <laughs> and being a peacemaker is pathetic and it's a waste of time. 
But you know what I say? Being a peacemaker is not for the weak. Being a peacemaker is for the strong. Let me tell you, when you think about being a peacemaker and think of it being weak, I have a question for people like that. Do you think that Jesus is weak? Do you think the person that created the entire universe, the person that submitted himself in Philippians chapter two says that he humbled himself even to the point of death and hanging himself on the cross. Do you think he's weak? The person that was spit on, maligned, judged in the night unfairly. The person that was flogged and beaten with the cat of nine tails. The one who created the cosmos, who has all power and authority. Do you think he's weak? Or did, or did like the goat, he submit himself for something even greater? Oh, come on, somebody. Are you out there? He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit has to say. I don't think being a peacemaker is for the weak at all. I think peacemakers have done the hard work by journeying, taking the journey inward and making peace with themselves and peace with God, asking for the forgiveness of their sins, humbling themselves before the creator and saying, God, I I know I'm just but a flesh and bones, but send me out to the fields to, to make peace where there is discord. Come on, somebody. Being a peacemaker is not for the weak. You know how easy it is to walk away from conflict? How easy it, away it is to ignore the issues, to pretend like it, they aren't happening, but God tells us to do the hard thing, the strong thing by being peacemakers and going to places, to, uh, going into conflicts to reconcile them, to help them, to be a, a sense of a healing balm in a bruised and in a sore world filled with conflict. Come on, somebody. Being a peacemaker is not for the weak, but for the very strong people who submitted themselves to God and who are not. And you know, you know the thing about submission? Sub, weak people do not, weak, it's, people who submit are not weak. It's strong people who submit. Come on, somebody. So people who know themselves. You know, you don't have to submit to crazy. You don't have to submit to foolishness. You know one thing that the Holy Spirit has told me? Every time I I, I gladly, willingly submit to God and his Holy Spirit and my Savior. You know why? Watch this. God has never hurled insults at me. God has never forcefully made me submit. Why? Because he's filled with love and compassion. And there's something called grace that enables me to submit because he's not foolish, he's not crazy. So, so don't, let's not get it twisted, y'all, for a second, all right? God does not ask you to submit to foolishness and to confusion and to disarray, all right? He's asked you to submit into areas where you know you can be a blessing and may, permeate peace. Come on, somebody, you out there, all right? How about this? There's a few principles I wanna teach you right now about making peace, about being a peacemaker, all right? The goal of peacemaking, watch this. I need you to write this down for a second. Take out uh, some post-its or a notepad. Watch this. The goal of a peacemaker, all right, the goal of peacemaking is not to win arguments, but to win relationships. Let me say that again. The goal of peacemaking, write this down on the chat, is not winning arguments, but to win relationships. Let me tell you, if Jesus came to the earth and all his role was, was to win arguments, even though he did win arguments, all right? He, there would have been no change or transformation. I believe that he did win a lot of co- uh, arguments, so to speak. But I think what was at stake and what was more important in the regards to peacemaking was to win in relationships. I have a question for you this, this morning. Are you always trying to be right? Are you always trying to fight to be right? Let me tell you, you might be right, but sometimes you can be very wrong too by trying to be blindly right or blindly ambitious or being blindly determined, all right? Someone once said this, silence is a great peacemaker. Let me tell you, as a pastor, I hear the most incredible stuff, all right? Stuff that's out there, stuff that's crazy, stuff I can't even believe people did or I can't even believe people say or said. But watch this, sometimes, there, people are not looking for me to just win an argument and me be right as the pastor. Sometimes people just need you to hear and listen, need you to listen to their heart. 
before you tell them how they're wrong, all right? Sometimes people just want their heart to be felt and their heart to be listened to. Sometimes you're in an argument and no matter, you can be right and no matter what you say, you'll never be right. Have you ever been in one of those arguments? You know you're right, but everything you say is still wrong to them, even though you know you're right. That's why we're trying to win relationships, all right? And when we do so, watch this. It's important that peacemakers, write this down, clarify, don't confront. Clarify, don't confront, all right? Uh, uh, it's important. Sometimes we're arguing. We don't even know what we're arguing about. What is the problem? That's why clarity is important. All right. Watch this. Being a peacemaker in relationships means you're focused on the reconciliation before the resolution. Write that down in the chat. Reconciliation before the resolution. And I love this one. Watch this. It means that you attack the problem and not the person being a peace, write this down right now. Being a peacemaker means that you're attacking the problem and not the person. Jesus has done this so well. He's done this in the Bible with the woman that I was sharing, uh, telling you about. There's another woman, the woman, the Samaritan woman who was at the well. Remember, Jesus sits down and he talks to her and he's being very peaceable. Would you give me a drink of water? Right? And he has this conversation and what eventually happens is he tells her, woman, you've had five husbands and the woman, the man that you're with right now, you're not even married to. He is telling her the problem, but he's not attacking her. Do you see that? He's graceful with her. He loved, he's loving her. He's peaceable with her. How many times in our relationships, in our marriages, right? We'd be fighting and we're not attacking the problem. We're putting down the person. We're hurting the person. We're tearing them apart. Watch this. Everything that God has uh, uh, called us to do in our spiritual life is to be like him, is to be like Jesus, all right? It's to be like him. And that's why it's so important to lead out of the spirit and not of the flesh, all right? There's a scripture here in my notes. Let me go to it. It says this about... Uh, uh, emulating Jesus. First John chapter two, five through six. Watch this. And this is why it's so important to be a peacemaker in our life. You know, you, as I've done a lot of study and, and read the biblical text, let me tell you, there's not a lot of teaching on being a peacemaker. There just isn't. Why? It's not sexy. It's not, it's not a fun for people, right? It's a hard thing to do. All right, we need to take the plunge inward first and, and, and have peace with God and work on peace in our relationships. You just don't hear a lot about it. But let me tell you right now, we, are, we, are, we live in a season where so much conflict exists and so much peace making needs to be had. And as followers of Jesus, we need to be uh, representations of him. But watch this, we need to emulate him too. Because if Jesus did this, we need to do this. Watch this, First John Two, five, and six say this, say this in the NLT. It says, but those who obey God's word truly show how, right truly on the chat right now. But those who obey God's word truly show how they completely love him. That is how we know that we're living in him. Those that say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Let me tell you right now, boo-boo, all right? There are tons of Christians who pick and choose, all right? Like my pastor used to say, a cafeteria, a tray. What they want to do and what they want to follow or what kind of characteristics they want uh, uh, to emulate. But watch this as, uh, from Jesus. But God, God has called us to be completely like him. Even the parts that are hard for us to be like, but it, uh, uh, he has called us to completely emulate him. And it's, we're a work in progress. We might not be there today. We might not be there tomorrow or an hour from now, but it's a progress. It's just called sanctification in the doctrine of Christianity, all right? Continually being sanctified by the Holy Spirit as we submit to him. Come on, somebody. It says this in Ephesians chapter five, verses one through two A in the message. It says this, watch out, uh, excuse me, watch what God does. I like this. Watch what God does and then you do it. Like children who learn proper behavior from their parents. Mostly what God does is love you. Keep company with him and learn a life of love. Are you keeping company 
with Jesus Christ this morning? Or are you picking and choosing what you want to do? Come on, somebody. Because we will be held accountable as Christians. How about this? When it comes to peacemaking and, our, uh, and not winning arguments, but winning in relationships, watch this. It means that you talk to the person. This is a big one. It means that you talk to the person and not about them. How many times when we're confronted or we're, there's conflict in a relationship, do we talk about the people behind their pat, back and put them down and, and, and throw their name under the rug? But when it comes to being around them, we're, 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 it's like we have a mask on, we're pretending. It's not okay to talk about a person, all right, but go directly to them in a peaceable way and talk to them and resolve the conflict. Watch this. And this is something I honestly look at as a pastor in my relationships. And it's something you should look for in your relationships. Well, watch this. There's like the old saying goes, let me, uh, uh, let me just stop right here for a moment. Gossip is so deadly. Gossip is so poisonous. I've seen over the years in ministry, in my own church and growing up in the church, how gossip hurts communities, how gossip hurts people, and there is no need for it. Gossip is a reflection of the heart, of the soul. And maybe we can't say the right things and it's hard for us to be kind because right now we have an issue with the heart. Out of the, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. We've heard that before. So maybe we need a heart checkup right now. Maybe today our assignment is before we can make peace with others, we need some peace in our own heart because what's coming out is just spewing and death and not life. All right, gossip kills and it's something that God actually abhors and it says that in the Psalms. But watch this, talking about gossip and something I look out for. Those who gossip to you, watch this, will gossip about you. I can't tell you how many times people have gossiped to me. And you know, what's important right now is to shut that down. Shut that down when people start gossiping to you about another person, a family member, a person in the church or whatever it is. But to shut that down, all right? And to be a peacemaker, all right? It's important that in this season and in this climate that we're living a life of peacemaking. Let me tell you, no matter who's in the Oval Office this week, because I know it's a big week. I know that people are afraid. I know that people are excited. I know there's a lot of emotion and a lot of feelings. I know that there's a lot of things going on right now, but watch this, no matter who is in the Oval Office, I can tell you one thing right now that gives me assurance and should give you assurance. Watch this, God is still on the throne, all right? He is sovereign and he's still in control. And it's not just about red and blue, baby. Come on, somebody. It's about Jesus Christ right now and how we can live up uh, uh, to being good Christians and representing the kingdom. That's why God has called me to start, or begin this series or to, to preach about this series is because peace is so much needed and there's so much conflict in the world. Chances are anyone you bump into, all right, this week, they are facing conflict, all right? And that's an opportunity, a prime opportunity to be a peacemaker. I love what... St. Francis of Assisi said, he said, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek. Watch this. Now this will test your maturity in Jesus. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive and it's in pardoning that we are pardoned and it's in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen and amen and amen. And an, an amazing man of God, St. Francis of Assisi. By the way, the Pope, who is in um, 
uh, is installed today has gotten his name, St. Francis, from this man, St. Francis of Assisi, wonderful, legendary person of the faith, all right, and Catholic, obviously. But what I want to do right now is I want to take time to be engaged and practical, okay? Uh, uh, I want to take this time because I know that it's a big, big week for uh, the nation, for us, for our communities, uh, for our children even. Uh, I want us to take the time to be a bit practical. So what I've asked right now is I've asked my dear friend Ronnie to actually lead us into prayer. And I, I want us to take the opportunity to pray for healing in our nation. I want us to take the opportunity to pray to be peacemakers in this season, in this spiritual climate that we're in. And after he's done praying, I actually have written a, a, a paragraph or so, a prayer. I would love for you in your home, what you're gonna see on the screen after, after Ronnie praise is you're going to see um, a prayer that I've written out. I would love for you to pray this prayer. I would love for you to pray it with your family. I would love for you to pause the video or whatever it is and, and write it out or take a picture of it and pray during the week because here's the reality. Our country needs prayer and people may not be happy with the outcome. All right. People may be upset. People may be in fear, but this is a prime opportunity to pray for the peace of our country. You know, another word for peace, watch this, is actually in, in Hebrew, is welfare. To pray for the welfare of our nation and of our people, that we would prosper and that we would have unity, not disunity. So let's go ahead and let's take the opportunity right now to say a few prayers. Go ahead, Ronnie, take it away. Hey church, so grateful to be with you again. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes as we come before the God of peace. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you again, God. First and foremost, we want to acknowledge you as the sovereign Lord. God, we believe that you see all things, that you know all things, but even more so, God, we believe that you work all things together for good to those that love you and are called according to your purpose. So this morning, Father, we pray for your peace over our land. God, right now, our country is so divided, Father, and we know that it is only through you that peace could enter our land. So we ask, Father, that you would have your way, Father. Lord, that you would help us to be peacemakers in the world, Father. You would help us not to look at things with an earthly eye, Father, but that we would be able to put on the mind of Christ, God, and that we would have our hearts filled with compassion and filled with love toward everyone. We ask that you would forgive us, God, for those times in our lives where we were not peacemakers, Father, where we were the people that caused division, God. We ask, Father, that you would heal our hearts, Father, and that you would help us to focus on you, Father. Help us to realize that even when the world looks like it's in chaos, Father, even when our nation looks like it's in turmoil, you are still in control over everything, God. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And now we want to invite you to pray this prayer along with us. Awesome. Wasn't that amazing? Thank you so much for praying that prayer. Thank you so much for engaging. And honestly, thank you so much, church, for investing yourself on Sunday mornings. Uh, I believe that God, and here's the thing about this message series, that God has really just ingrained in me. You know, every time I get to pray, or not every time, but there are times when I pray, God gives me foreshadowings of our church's future, of what we look like. And you know what I see? In our future as a church, the calling church, I see a people making a difference on behalf of the kingdom of God, no matter what's going on in our world and in our community. You know what I see? I see people being touched by the healing grace and redemptive power of Jesus. I see our church growing because our church is taking the mounts or taking the gospel message forward, which is so amazing and awesome. I see a people, a church that um, in my prayer times that is so shining and resplendent. You know, I want to let you know this in my prayer times as well, 
God has created this church, not me. I simply responded to the call of this church, of, of the planting this church and my wife. But what you see in our church is what God is doing and there are greater things to come. And this is exactly why God started this church. God, you know the thing about Jesus is he knew that th these times of, of tumultuousness uh, would be here present, but he created us as a church to be the solution to the conflict that we see. Come on somebody, amen. Hey, I have an important question to ask you this morning. Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Do you have a relationship with Jesus? Now I'm not asking if you know about Jesus. I'm not asking if you have a cross necklace. I'm not asking if you've been to church one time or your grandma was a pastor and so forth. I'm asking you right now, have you humbled yourself uh, to acknowledge that you are a sinner? And you know, that might sound funny, but that's the reality of, the, of, of, of today. That's the reality of human frailty is that we're sinners. And without Jesus, there is no hope, all right? Uh, uh, but with Jesus, watch this, he offers the forgiveness of sins. You know what I love about Jesus? I mentioned earlier in the, in the sermon, is that he, Jesus came across so many people who are broken and hurt and living in bondage. But he came beside them and he spoke life into them. And you know what he also, he, what he also did? He built their life. You know, over the last 15, maybe even 20 years as I followed Jesus in my own life, I can tell you right now, Jesus has never beat me down. Jesus never kicked me while I've been down. Jesus never hurt me or harmed me with his words, with his great power and his great authority. You know, every time I've even messed up, you know what Jesus has always done? He's always built me back up to, to uh, put me on my path and my purpose. Jesus wants to do the very same thing for you this morning. Can I ask you, can I go further? Is there some peace that needs to be had in some of the relationships in your life? Is there some peace that needs to be had in your life? See, this is what peacemakers do. They, 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 they make peace with themselves and with God. They make peace in their own relationships and they also arbitrate peace and reconcile peace in others. That's what God wants to do with your life. But let me ask you this question. Do you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? The Bible says, do not wait. Today is the day of salvation. In other words, we don't know about tomorrow. Tomorrow is never promised to anybody, but why not receive the forgiveness of your sins? You might say, Pastor Michael, I used to go to church. I used to follow Jesus. I used to read the Bible, but now things have happened in my life and I've ended up in a different place in my life because of certain decisions I've made and certain relationships I've entered, in, entered into in my life and that have led me astray. But here's the good news. God will take you back and he will put you back on the path of his purpose and his calling and his redemptive plan for your life, amen? So you say, pastor, that's me. I would love to receive Jesus as my Lord and savior. I would love to pray this prayer or have you repeat this prayer after me. Would you bow your heads with me? Say, dear Jesus, thank you for sending your son, uh, excuse me, say, dear God, thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die for my sins. I believe I'm a sinner and I'm in need of a savior. Jesus, I repent and I change, I, I, I wanna change my direction. I, I actually, I am changing my direction and I'm going toward you. Jesus, live in my heart, live in my mind. Jesus, give me your peace and help me to make peace with others. I trust you, I love you, put me on my path and put me on your purpose in your put me on my purpose and your plans. I confess with my mouth and I believe with my heart that Jesus Christ is Lord of my life. I just want to congratulate you. If you said that for the first time, that is the most important decision you can ever make in your life is living a right relationship with Jesus. Let me tell you, he has a purpose and a plan for you. And you'll discover that as you continue to follow him and grow up in him. Well, church, I love you. It's my honor. Hey, go make peace out there and be filled with his peace. May the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. 
May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you his divine peace. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, everybody said, amen, amen. God bless you, church. We'll see you next Sunday.